Hello friends. Today we will be discussing a very important English doctrine. The name of the doctrine is doctrine of strict liability. In Indian context, this doctrine is known as absolute liability. What is the rationale behind this doctrine? Friends, in our lives, we are confronted with so many hazardous, harmful activities of nature that they pose a constant danger to person and property. The law may deal with such hazardous actions in three ways. It may prohibit them altogether or it may allow them to be carried on for the sake of their social utility but only in accordance with regulation that are statutory in nature and hence laying down safety measures and providing for sanctions for non-compliance. And the third one is it may allow them to be tolerated on conditions that they pay their way regardless of any fault. This last method which I mentioned is the doctrine of strict liability. Therefore, we understood the rationale of the crux of strict liability doctrine is that those who resort to a hazardous activity must pay their way regardless of any fault. This principle actually is close, closely related to negligence because risks involved are so obviously inherent as to be foreseeable, but with this difference that the defendant would be held liable even if he could not by reasonable care avoid the damage. Sometimes a person whom you call as defendant here is liable for the harm caused to the another plaintiff even though there is no negligence on his part and the defendant never intends such a harm to come to the other person. In such cases, even the defense of inevitable accident is not a valid defense. This rule therefore attaches even without any fault on the part of defendant. This is known as strict liability doctrine or liability without fault. Thus in nutshell, this doctrine is that the activities coming within its purview are those entailing extraordinary risk to others either in the seriousness or frequency of the harm threatened. Now let us understand the basic principle of this liability under this doctrine. We must understand under law of thoughts one can sue the other for damages ensuing from violation of legal right in one person and violation of legal duty by the other or one cannot be held liable for violation of social and moral duties. Therefore, a person is liable for those wrongs on his part which he intends to bring about or which resulted due to negligent act on his part and which means that those liabilities are based on fault. The doctrine of strict liability stands as an exception to this statement which says wrongdoer will be held liable for the consequences of his acts even though he has been vigilant enough while doing the act or even though there is no negligence on his part or even if there is no intention on his part to bring the result ensued. The doctrine of strict liability is also known as no fault liability which means even without the fault of defendant, he is liable despite the fact that there is no negligence on the part of defendant and the defendant has no desire to cause damage to the plaintiff. Let us understand what Dr. Winfield has said about this doctrine. Dr. Winfield prefers word strict as against word absolute for describing the liability under that rule as enunciated in Rarian versus Fletcher. The nature of liability is absolute though subject to certain qualifications which take away a great deal of its absolute character. It is also absolute in sense that the absence of intent or negligence is by itself no defense in this case. This doctrine was given in a very famous case of Raylan versus Fletcher that was decided in 1866. The defendant owner who was a mill owner of a mill, he connected by arrangements with the owner of a certain land, a reservoir 
on it for their meal. The plaintiff had a colliery in the locality and there were two other owners of land between the reservoir and the plaintiff's colliery. The soil under the reservoir had been at some former time beyond living memory which created problem eventually while constructing the reservoir. The defendant employed competent contractors and engineers for constructing the reservoir. When the persons employed for the work were excavating for the bed of the reservoir, they found some shafts filled up with soil and they found it with weak support. The reservoir had no embankments. Soon after water was brought into the reservoir, one of the shafts burst and water escaped through the underground workings to those under the intermediate lands and finally gushed into the plaintiff's mines and flooded them. Judgment delivering by Lord Justice Blackburn, he said that on behalf of the court, he held that the plaintiff was entitled to recover and made the following well-known statement on the rule. We think that true rule of law is that the person who for his own purpose brings on his land and collects and keeps there anything likely to do mischief, if it escapes, must keep it in on his own peril, and if he does not do so, is prima facie answerable for the damage which is the natural consequences of its escape. He can excuse himself by showing that the escape was due to the plaintiff's default, or perhaps that the escape was the consequence of this major which is called act of God. But as nothing of this sort exists here, it is unnecessarily to inquire what excuse would be sufficient. In appeal, the House of Lords approved Justice Blackburn's statement of the law which he made earlier. The pronouncement in this case has been regarded as establishing rule of absolute liability like that of an insurer in a particular class of cases. This rule of strict liability, however, qualified by a number of exceptions which considerably reduce the scope of its operation. It may be said thus, a person is subject to the exception to the considered below liable absolutely of if he brings or accumulates on his land something likely to do mischief if escapes and damage arises as a natural consequence of its escape. In this connection, it is important to note two things. Firstly, the court took a rule of liability which had been more or less clearly perceived in connection with the escape of fire, cattle or unruly beasts and extended it to the escape of mischievous things generally. Secondly, they laid down that the occupier from whose land these things escaped and did damage is liable not only for the default of his servant but also for that of an independent contractor and for that of an anyone except a stranger. Hence for the application of this rule, three conditions are essential. Some dangerous thing must have been brought by a person on his land. Second. The thing thus brought or kept on his land by a person must escape. It must be non-natural use of land. We must understand that this strict principle of law is based on a well-known maxim. That is, sic atre toit at elenum non leodas, which means everyone must so use his own as not to do damage to another. Dear student, let us have an overview of these three conditions under doctrine of strict liability. Dangerous thing, the defendant must bring, introduce, keep or collect something on his property which is dangerous and that the thing which is likely to do mischief if it escapes, for example, a larger body of water, electricity, gas, vibrations, 
सीवेज एक्सप्लोसिव फायर फायर वर्कस नॉक्शियस स्मर्ट्स हीप्स ऑफ सॉइल कॉजिंग लैंड स्लाइड्स यू ट्रीज डेंजरस टू कैटल थिंग्स लाइकली टू स्टार्ट अ फायर बीस्ट फिल्थ एंड स्टेंच अनहेल्दी फ्यूम्स एंड वेपर्स ऑयल ट्रैक्शन इंजन डेंजरस एनिमल्स चेयर लिफ्ट ए फ्लैग पोल और एक्स्ट्रा फॉर एग्जाम्पल इन हॉयर एंड कंपनी वर्सेज मैक एल्पिन दैट वॉज डिसाइड इन नाइनटीन ट्वेंटी थ्री द वाइब्रेशन कॉजड बाय द ड्राइविंग ऑफ पायल्स बाय द डिफेंडेंट इन प्रिपरेशन ऑफ ए बिल्डिंग साइट डैमेज एन एंशियंट होटल बिलोंगिंग टू द प्लेंटिवस ऑन द अदर साइड ऑफ द रोड On the principle of Rayland versus Fletcher, the plaintiff were entitled to damages. Now, second thing, escape. It is also necessary for the application of this rule that the thing causing damage must escape to the area outside the occupation or control of the defendants. To understand this, let us see the case of Reed versus Lyons and Company, which was decided in 1947 on this point. The plaintiff in this case was an employee in the defendant's ammunition factory. While she was performing her duties inside the defendant's premises, a shell which was being manufactured there exploded, where where she was injured. There was no evidence of negligence on the part of defendants. The shell which exploded was a dangerous thing. It was held. that the defendant were not liable because there were no escape of the things outside the premises of the defendants and therefore the relevance rule did not apply if it had been because defendants action then he would have been made liable under this rule and the third condition for this rule is non natural use of land it means some special use of a thing which brings with it the increased danger to others it must not only be the ordinary use of land for example if a person helps 20 to 20 if a person have 20 to 25 gas cylinders in a residential area it is a non natural use but if he keeps 2 to 3 gas cylinders it is a natural use of land ordinarily water installations in a house or a flat domestic fire in a house growing trees on land building a house a putting and putting cattle to graze on land gas pipes in a house or shops electric wiring in a house or shops ordinary working of mines and minerals on land to operate in an explosive factory in time of war or natural uses of land in an indian case sarya prasad versus mahadev prasad that was decided in 1932 the defendant dug a trench on their own land but adjoining the well of the plaintiff so that the foundations of the plaintiff's house were uncovered and it being a rainy season rain water had accumulated in the trench the water in the trench percolated into and under the foundations of the plaintiff's house so that damage was caused to the walls and the floors of his house the defendant were held liable on the principle of rayland versus fletcher regarding the non natural use of the land therefore to sum up one must remember that the rule applies only if the defendant brings or acquirable on his land something that is likely to escape and do mischief it will not apply to the escape of things naturally on the land and rule of liability is not absolute one but may arise by negligence now exceptions to this doctrine this rule of relevance versus fletcher has been applied after a long time in later cases to gas to electricity oil noxious fumes colliery spoil rusty wire from a decayed fence vibrations poisonous vegetations and flag pole etc this rule does not apply 
if the mischievous thing is collected under statutory authority. The land is put to non natural use, the escape of the thing is by act of God, the wrongful act of third party, plaintiff's own fault, or the consent of the plaintiff, and such cases the defendant can be made liable under no fault liability. Let us discuss these exceptions in a brief view. Statutory authority. When damage is the consequence of an act done for the public purpose in the discharge of a public duty under the express authority of a statute, then Rayland's rule has no application. Natural use. If damage is caused due to natural use of land, the defendant is not liable. If, for example, as a result of mining operation on one's land, a neighbor's land is inundated due to gravitational force, no liability attaches. But if this inundation takes place due to pumping, the defendant is liable. Things naturally on land and not essentially dangerous. In respect of the things naturally on land, the principle has no application. For example, in Noble versus Harrison, it was a case in 1926, the defendant was not held liable for the injury caused to the plaintiff by fall of the branch of an apparently good tree in the defendant's land. There is a very important doctrine under this rule that was given by the English court that is known as doctrine of common benefit. Friend, this is a very important doctrine while understanding the exceptions to the rule of strict liability. It says that when the injury is caused to the plaintiff from a thing which is maintained in the premises for common benefit of both the plaintiff and the defendant, the latter will not be held liable. In another case of Care Stairs versus Taylor, 1871, the defendant in this case, an occupant of the upper story of a building, he was held not liable to the plaintiff. The occupant of the lower story has made for, for damages caused to him by escape of water from a water box in the upper story. A rat gnawed in a hole in a box which caused the leakage of the water then a very important thing that is act of God, which acts an exception to this rule, which you call as vis major. An act of God is an event or accident resulting from operation of natural forces so unexpected that no human foresight or skill could reasonably be expected to anticipate it. It means an extraordinary act which could not be reasonably expected or anticipated and it must not arise from the act of man. It is only those acts which can be traced to natural forces and which have nothing to do with intervention of human agency that could be said to be act of God. Therefore, this form refers to such overwhelming operations of natural forces as a tempest or an extraordinary rainfall and flood. Salmond on torts define it is an by referring to a Latin maxim, which is actus die nemini facet injurium, which means an act of God does a wrong to nobody. Because, for example, earthquake do not constitute a wrong which gives a right to claim against anybody for consequential damage or injury suffered. In GW Railway versus SS Mostyn, a case decided in 1928, Lord Moore said of this phrase that is an untheological expression well understood by lawyers. But Lord Blensburg in same case spoke of it as an irresistible and unsearchable providence nullifying all human efforts. As to its use in Roman law, 
It is also known as damnum fatale or vis naturalis or causa major or force majore. In an Indian case of Rana Linga Nadar versus Narayan Rajar, this is a case decided by Kerala High Court in 1997. In this case, a criminal activity of an unruly mob which robbed the goods transported in the defendants was held to be not an act of God. Wrongful act of third party or act of stranger. This also forms an exception to the rule of strict liability. In order to avail this defense, it must be proved that the escape was due to wrongful act of a third party or stranger. The defendant did not have any control over him and as there was no negligence on his part. Thus, where the harm is caused due to the act of stranger, who is in no way under the control of the defendant, the defendant is not liable under this rule. And there is next one, plaintiff's own fault. This defense to this rule of Roland v. Fletcher was recognized long ago in the cases of cattle trespass, where it was due to the plaintiff's breach of duty to fence his land. Similarly, a person cannot complain of injury due to his meddling with a dangerous thing or to his trespassing in another premises or to some neglect on his part. There is another exception that is consent of the plaintiff. The principle of voluntary non-fit injuria is a well-known principle which means where there is consent, there is no injury. Where the plaintiff has consented to the accumulation of dangerous things on the defendant's land, he cannot sue if it escapes and causes some damage. In Care State versus Taylor, it was held that in high-rise apartments, water is stored in tanks for the common use of tenants in the building living on different floors. If water escapes or leaks without any negligence on the part of defendant, he is not liable. The rule of strict liability does not apply if the source of danger, for example, water tanks, gas pipes, electric wiring, is maintained for the common benefit of both the plaintiff and the defendant. With this, we conclude our today's program.